So, Francis, lovely to meet you. Thanks for being here. You and I have got the task of bringing this home with Head in LA. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get started, Francis, uh, perhaps by asking you, what is uh, your 30-second elevator pitch? Yeah. Um, so the ambition of the business is, is to rethink hospitality from the ground up. Um, you know, we think primarily there's a design opportunity, uh, make the spaces architecturally feel really amazing, um, but also really reconsider the experience design at every touch point. Uh, we think it could be done radically differently in a way where people are going to uh, find their stays far more interesting. Um, and then the second piece is, um, you know, by rethinking the operations in the, in the back end of providing that experience, are there opportunities to leverage technology to radically reduce its cost structure? Uh, and if you take both those things together, you can offer a really amazing experience that, that rivals some of the best brands uh, that have price points that are really inaccessible to the vast majority of consumers and democratize those experiences. Uh, and the belief is that it's possible to do this across alternative accommodations or short-term rentals where we started, uh, but also hotels and villas in any accommodation category. And, 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 and the ambition for us you know, in the long run is to, is to do that globally. Okay, great, excellent. Um, in terms of marketplaces versus providers, in the past you've spoken about Sonder as being the missing quadrant of accommodations. Um, can you explain what you actually mean by that in context of the traditional breakdown between marketplaces and providers? Yeah, so this is, this is mainly a construct when people had a hard time distinguishing Sonder from Airbnb. Um, so the idea was that you know, Airbnb is more akin to booking an Expedia connector of buyers and sellers in a sense, um, pure online marketplace, and that Sonder was building essentially the modern version of uh, a Marriott or a Hilton, but as applied to alternative accommodations. Like that, that, that description is no longer accurate now that we've, we also are in the hotel business. We added uh, 3,400 keys last quarter, of which over 1,000 were hotel rooms. Um, and so now the hotel business is becoming a, a greater and greater share of what we do. So that analogy doesn't quite work anymore, but, right. um, but all that to say that we're not a pure marketplace business. We actually are a brand operator and we view the business models of, of, of the large hotel chains as more analogous to what we do. Okay, okay. In terms of customer experience, Booking.com and, and the other OTAs talk a lot about the connected and the seamless trip today. Google even have put a skin on booking engines to unify that shopping experience. Where are you on the seamless travel experience? What's your perspective on that? Um, so we've actually, we have about 100 uh, engineers at Sonder that are working on basically um, how to make the experience frictionless from start to finish. Um, the vast majority of Sonder buildings don't have a single employee there. Um, and where we started as a you know, business that had highly distributed inventory, like one unit here and there, uh, now uh, the vast majority, actually more than 50% of the units we added in 2019 were in buildings where we have over 100 units. So there's this concentration effect that's occurred and we operate multi-hundred unit buildings and large hotels um, that don't have staff on premise, uh, but that have extraordinarily high customer satisfaction and so therefore, um, you know, uh, really attractive margins. And so, um, you know, the idea is that it's actually better to skip the front desk. And, um, and actually, we've surveyed our guests and we've asked them, um, if you want an extra towel, uh, do you prefer that we bring it to your room within 15 minutes? Or do you prefer to go down the hall or on the ground floor, there's a space that's dedicated to a series of amenities, like an essentials area, and take it yourself. And uh, over 85% of the guests that stay with us actually prefer the self-service option, regardless of whether um, you know, uh, regardless of whether it's more efficient to do it that way from our perspective. So just as a pure consumer choice preference. Um, so basically it's just a, the, the deconstruction of every service that's provided in a hotel. I was actually just a couple weeks ago, even I, I for the first time stayed in, in Amman uh, in, in uh, Japan, and I was looking at all the services they provide. If I go at the very high end of hospitality and I look at everything that they can ever provide, uh, what are things that uh, are no longer needed in the era of people with supercomputers in their pockets? And, um, and what are the things that could easily be you know, replaced uh, by uh, a, uh, you know, a service that's a little bit less heavy handed? Mm. Um, and there's very little that's, that, that at, you end at the luxury level that you can't replace or rethink uh, in a more modern way. And so our definition of seamlessness is really one where the guest is in control of their experience, where they have a mobile app on the Sonder mobile app. You can have access to how everything in your unit works, how to make the thermostat work. You can have access to recommendations. You can re request an early check-in. You can change the dates of your booking. All of that kind of stuff can be done without the intervention of us. And if you request things, those things are sent directly to, um, through our dispatch platform, directly to the uh, employees that are responsible for delivering something. If there's a maintenance request, as an example, it goes straight to the maintenance agent. Um, so all that to say that, um, you know, in our view, a seamless experience really is one that is self-guided 
Um, and, and that also has tremendous benefits for the democratization of what is ultimately, uh, you know, experiences that are in core locations with, with impressive architecture and design. Mm -hmm. Okay. And obviously we've got a lot of OTAs in the audience here with us uh, over the last few days. If there was one thing that you needed to improve on in relation to the guest experience from them, what would it be? Hmm. I, um, I think, you know, OTAs have demonstrated, particularly Booking, Expedia, incredible at driving conversion on their sites. And so there's a great amount of science that's been applied to make that happen. I think there's potentially a design disconnect, especially for our kind of inventory, for people to understand, especially when we're listing a hotel, that um, you know, our kind of hotel experience is not like a traditional hotel, that there's no front desk, that there's housekeeping isn't provided daily, it's on demand and you have to pay for it. These kinds of ideas like, aren't easy to communicate. So actually what we've resorted to is on our hotel listings, we put an image that says, hey, this is what the, this, we're sonder and this is what the stay comes with. And so the listings don't actually provide a clear enough platform to basically uh, educate um, users and potential guests as to what is it exactly that we're providing. So I think there, that could be you know, some, an improvement. I'm not sure it's entirely rational for them to like, change their product roadmap to deal with what is ultimately still a really niche component of the market. Um, but you know, if, uh, in, in our dream world, we'd have um, a really uh, easy opportunity to express exactly expectations that guests would have. Um, and we still manage to set those expectations with guests, but it's with uh, additional touch points that aren't as smooth. Um, so we have to put images like that have contained text in the, in the series of photos. And we have to send, you know, after the, the booking is complete, we have to send a series of emails to educate. And so there's a series of things here that um, you know, aren't, aren't exactly smooth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving on to education and learning, I've um, been told that you are actually yourself six credits short to completing your own degree. What was it that made you pull a Zuckerberg? Yeah. Um, I don't think I was thinking about, um, you know, replicating some, some of the really successful entrepreneurs. And from that perspective, it was just, you know, I started the business when I was a freshman in college. And by the time um, you know, I was about to complete my degree. We had something like 15 employees and I just hadn't attended class in months and so wasn't able to, I showed up to the exams and failed two of them because I just uh, yeah. had done none of the work. So, um, you know, I, yeah, to me it was, it was just, it wasn't a conscious decision to drop out, but rather there's something more important. And I've, I'm one that loves academia. I think, you know, I would love to go back and do a PhD at some point. Yeah. Uh, I really love the intellectual challenge and I actually consider entrepreneurship and building a business really much. Um, as, as a, an extraordinary intellectual challenge. Um, so I, I really love it, but, um, but you know, uh, I'm deploying 100% of my neuronal energy right now towards just building this company. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, the degree is secondary. Sure, okay, good. You're still obviously now within Sonder expanding your team. What would you say is, core, is Sonder's core competency? Um, yeah, so I think you know, what I described with regards to our vision, it's really like at the end of the day, what matters to create value in business is, is there, do you have, you know, do customers love what you do? And um, are you capable of opening that up to people that, you know, don't have the money to spend to be at the really high end of the consumer experiences within a certain category? So that's really like we wake up every day thinking through how do we provide a better experience and how would you, do we do so, do so at a more reasonable cost? Um, you know, another thing that we've been done quite well, like, um, there's the mention of like 60 or so, or like a series of brands in our space. There's 12, we've, we've, we're, we track 12 venture back companies in our space that are doing something similar to what we're doing. Um, and we've become larger than all of the others combined. Uh, we have now 14,000 units um, that are under, that are contracted and about 5,000 that are operated today. Um, and, uh, and that's more than, than, than you know, by far the others. And it's not that we got a huge head start that we got started years before. Uh, but rather we've just been growing incredibly rapidly. The business is growing at 200% right now mm. for 1,300 employees and it got started just six years ago. Um, so like he, the commitment to growing extremely rapidly but doing so in a really diligent manner where, where we make sure that we don't compromise on the quality of the economics of the deals that we engage in and, and, and the quality of guest experience. I think you know, kind of the, uh, the, the really difficult tension between growth, economics and experience has been one that we've been particularly successful at mm. upholding. Good, good. Now, obviously, you know, you've, look, over the last few years, you've probably had a, an absolute roller coaster of a ride and you've experienced many learnings, no doubt. What would be three things that you'd tell yourself not to do if you could go back to your former self six years ago? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the business we have now is very different than what it was, frankly, even 18 months ago. Uh, so if you'd heard about Saunder then and haven't heard about us yet, there's a series of changes that have occurred that have, like, our, our business is completely different. Uh, one of the biggest ones being now the concentration 
So 70, over 75% of the units we operate, we actually control the entire building. And there's a lobby and there's common areas, and those are hotel licensed buildings. Um, for our apartment segment, which is now just 70% of our growth, 30% of our growth being hotels, and hotels you know, taking over. And the hotel business is just 12 months old, um, and um, it's, it's already a couple thousand keys. Um, so uh, I wish that we had arrived at that conclusion earlier. I think there's a lot of, you know, we don't love uh, some of our earlier markets, like Montreal, where I started the business, has a bunch of you know, apartments that are distributed throughout the city. Those are not cost efficient. It's difficult to control the quality of the experience. Um, and so you know, we're just finding ourselves like not keeping it and just really focusing in on our, you know, the big buildings that are a little bit larger. Mm -hmm. We still love the sub 100 keys because that's a space that's not been tackled by the traditional players. Um, so something that's like you know, between 40 and 125 like, is really a sweet spot for us. We can get um, uh, you know, great economies of scale. Um, it, it's worth our time, but it's not worth the big brand's time. Um, so uh, I just wish that we had, we had figured out basically that we hadn't done the onesie twosies and gone strict, like straight to larger projects. Uh, so maybe that's one learning. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, but let, let's, let's, take a, let, let's, let's keep it at that for now. Okay. But, but if I think of more, I can. On the flip side, if you were to turn that around, and what would, what would be, it doesn't have to be three, but what would be one or two things that you'd tell yourself to actually do, even if they were a mistake? Yeah. So what mistakes, mistakes that we've made um, yeah, this is like basically the evolution of the business model. Uh, so we started off like basically subletting properties and then afterwards uh, started leasing one unit at a time and now entire buildings. Um, I think um, uh, there's, there's something that occurred in the last 18 months, which I, you know, uh, was, was, was not a win for us. Uh, the expansion into basically corporate housing. Mm -hmm. So we have about, you know, 10 or 15% of our business, which are buildings where we know there's no regulatory path towards doing stays of less than 30 days. Like we have to do more than 30. And when we knew that the corporate housing business was charging, like the prices were too high and the experience wasn't great. So we thought we could come in and just undercut prices and then just win a bunch of corporate accounts for relocations and assignments. And that didn't work. Um, so um, we've ended up operating these properties essentially at a, at a loss, and now we're, we're selling our portfolio to businesses that are specialized in it. And I, I actually believe that it's possible to build a great disruptive business in corporate housing and do it better. And so I'm thinking about the Blue Grounds and Zeus and, and, and there's others. Um, but it's just unless, like, we can't do this as a side project. Mm -hmm. And we really decide to put all our chips in the hospitality business, and, and a lot of effort has gone into building the hotel business, which I, I think is really promising. But... Um, but the corporate housing business is just not one that's good, so we're actually exiting it. So that was probably like a $10 million mistake right there. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, in terms of regulations, obviously the alternative accommodation is um, fairly under the spotlight when it comes to being regulated. What uh, was once, an, what has been an alternative professionalized uh, and has now become mainstream? Tell us the ways that Sonda has worked with the cities where you're based now to ensure that you are above board when it comes to obviously taxes and, and proper zoning and licenses and things like that? Because I imagine that would be a challenge in, in every, every different city that you Absolutely. operate. Um, so actually just before today, I visited uh, three properties that are currently under construction right now for, uh, in Los Angeles for Sonder, representing about um, maybe 300, 350 units. And, um, you know, they're basically office conversions. Um, they're properties that we essentially execute, like there's one, one lease that we signed a little bit over a year ago, um, and the project's gonna be delivered 15 months from now, and that building is being converted specifically for our use. And it's meeting all the, you know, basically the, um, the, um, the code compliance requirements, zoning um, that a hotel is subject to. So basically we're, we're, we're working with developers to build hotels. That's like kind of the, like from a legal perspective, that's essentially what's occurring. Um, there's another slice of our business, which is like projects that are already under construction that are properly zoned. Um, we, uh, we've managed to also like kind of identify a slice of the market where it's possible from a regulatory perspective to get the, uh, the hotel license, as in it was, op it was basically buy a right for these owners. So when they bought their building, there was several uses that were available to them, uh, hotel being one of them. And so we basically have built a system to identify these assets and register them accor accordingly. So when we go and open a market, one of the first things we do is sit down with the regulators and we explain to them what our business model is, what are some of the assets that we're looking at, the fact that we pay taxes, that fire and safety isn't an issue, that we're properly insured, that um, 
you know, our business is done, you know, in accordance to, you know, all of the regulatory frameworks that exist. So we're not asking even for regulatory change. We basically just study the environment and then comply with it. Mm. Uh, so from that perspective, we're just a hospitality operator like, like, like any other. Okay. So do you see Sonder as a real estate company, a hotel company, or a tech company? Yeah, it's probably some mix, mixture of all of this. I think that probably the most accurate description would be like a tech-enabled hospitality brand. Okay. Um, without technology, there's no value proposition. We can't reduce the cost. And it, and there's no value creation, mm. um, but uh, but at our, you know we're responsible for delivering you know uh, now clo close to a million a million customers will have stayed with us so just in a few months from now so yeah and and those are folks that have relied on our operational execution from that perspective like we're a hospitality business uh, but we have a large real estate team and uh, so it's it's vertically integrated each each part each part of the puzzle is really critical for the whole thing to work. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, your pitch deck argues that you can compete with a hotel on reduced cost basis, providing owners of those properties a 70, 74% lower operating cost. Can you talk us through those? How do you achieve that? Um, like I mentioned, we we operate 100 plus unit you know, properties where where there's no labor on premise, um, and so self serve is a really critical one. Um, and then, um, and then afterwards, uh, for anything that's interact, like for instance, if you think about a concierge service, um, you could have it in high cost cities, uh, folks that are sitting with their hands behind their back the majority of the time because you know there's a, a, a variance in customer inbound requests. And um, you know another way to do it is to say we're going to have some folks that are in, in our case, in Denver, in Montreal, in London, and. Um, and they're going to be interacting via messaging instead of by voice and per person in interaction. They can manage four conversations at the same time. We're building technology to allow them to respond more quickly. Actually, we have a chat bot that now deflects about 25% of our, of our messaging volume. And as the tech becomes better and you feed more through it, then more and more of it. Like, where's the nearest, you know, great bar where I can do this? Like, I mean, boom, it's a look up in a table and a response uh, in, through the chat bot. So, um, that radically reduces basically like the, the amount of touch. Mm -hmm. and so if you get rid of, um, you know, the vast majority of, that, of those cost line items, like the, that really radically transforms the p and mm -hmm. uh, Housekeeping, it's on request. Um, and it turns out that when people, you know, when you, when you, you look at the true cost of daily uh, uh, kind of refresh cleans, um, it turns out that if you expose that price to the, to the guest, uh, almost never do they think it's a good idea for them to, um, to, to, to pay for it. It's just not worth the money. And mm. maybe like 50 years ago, and those standards were set 100 years ago, um, maybe, maybe the trade did make sense. Labor costs were so much lower. Mm. And maybe the people that were traveling were a little, like a wealthier tranche of society. But the fact that we've preserved those kinds of standards uh, for people that are you know, middle, middle class, middle, middle uh, income earners, um, you know, it's, it's just value destruction in our view. Uh, it's also bad for the environment. It's a standard that you don't have at home. Like, there's a lot of things that just make that suspicious. If you come from from within a hospitality, it's like a you know, it's a uh, it's it sounds like it's it's like you're a, a tragedy to the, the the institution of hospitality. But really, I don't think there's a rational reason why it makes sense for hotels to provide daily housekeeping. That's a pretty mm. big cost center. Yeah, good. Now, you obviously have a very high customer satisfaction score or rate as well. So, given that it is such a a self um, operating establishment how, how do you achieve that what what, what how, how do you get to I think that point? I think our check-in experience is way better than the check-in experience of you know uh, all four star hotels uh, and, and, and mo I'd say so every property is has its own individual check-in experience so people uh, get a code and they check themselves yeah, in essentially exactly we built our property. own connected home technology in a sense which updates code specifically for your stay and you know, as you request like you know a late checkout then that that code is adapted like a little bit like like was mentioned in the earlier panel uh, we've built that tech in-house. Um, and so basically you book, you arrive at the property and then you go straight to your room and then you enter the code and you get in and you're mm -hmm. done. Um, and then now we're also integrating more elements of like to introduce personality because like, hey, doesn't that feel a little bit cold? And so geofencing, as you arrive within the property, we recognize that you're there, we push you a message you know, with an emoji, welcome, um, uh, and then collateral inside of the unit. So there can actually be a warm welcoming with absolutely no, no human liberty. I think, I think something that's more uh, warm than the vast majority of front desk interactions I've had, where it's basically just like type, yeah. type, 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 give me a key yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things where you can deliver both a superior experience and a lower cost. Mm. Um, so uh, and then and then also people are just shocked that they can get like such large, beautifully designed spaces at such a low price. Mm -hmm. Like just that, even if our service isn't all that good, um, it's it's kind of magical to get that. Uh, our messaging, we answer 
the vast majority of the time within seconds. And so if you send us you know, a question, like we will write you back instantly 24 seven. And that's like also like pretty surprising for folks that we're capable of achieving that. And that's because we're pooling all of the requests that come globally and we can answer them quite rapidly. So um, no, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no silver bullet when it comes to experience. Um, but I'd say it's just kind of a, um, the, the, various, the premise of our business, like the cu customers are resonating with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Good. Do you have any plans to move into co-working or co-living as well? Uh, co-working, definitely not. Um, uh, co-living, uh, I wouldn't call it co-living, but we have a pilot right now called Sonder Residences. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a little bit like, you know, Four Seasons Residences, leverage some of the hospitality infrastructure that existed to properties to deliver that to residents. Um, uh, this, uh, I think it's an interesting concept, but one which, which I think, um, you know, would benefit from being available to, um, you know, normal, like, you know, middle income earners and so the idea behind Sonda Residences is for us to use our platform um, uh, that provides basically this automation of hospitality um, to, over to people that are living in Sonder spaces full time. Mm -hmm. And so we have, it's just one building so far, but it's leasing up faster than more normal multifamily. It's achieving higher rates. Um, so far, people seem to love it. And basically, as part of your rent, you can, you can choose the frequency at which you get housekeeping. Your linens and your towels get replaced. Uh, you know, your, your, your paper towels and all of your kitchen supplies get replaced. And by the way, we get all that stuff at a really low cost. And we already have the infrastructure to keep all of this maintained. So you can have basically a really well set up home uh, that you have to do no work in order to keep at a really high standard and you can keep it stocked and clean and functional. Uh, so, and then we also have some elements of community. So basically, yeah, the answer to the question is like, we think that uh, one part of our business that we're, we're, we're really careful about building infrastructure on the hospitality side that we can extend over to the residential housing market as well. Okay, good. When it comes to the technology side of things, what, in your opinion, do you feel, which technologies will disrupt travel the most in, in the next few years? Um, I haven't thought about just like the travel ecosystem as a whole. You know, we've been laser focused on the you know, technology that allows us to deliver hospitality experiences. I think I walked through some of them. Maybe I could throw a couple of other examples. Mm. I think there's, um, so basically there's five capabilities in our business and our tech organization has built um, maps to these five capabilities. So the first one is around underwriting and real estate acquisition. And so there's great, um, you know, tools that, are, that, that can be built to basically predict RevPAR for a property before it's built to a much greater degree of accuracy that allows us to basically grow through our, our, the leases that we've been signing with owners. Um, and so that's uh, just on the underwriting side, I'm, I'm still a little bit surprised that you have some people like in a spreadsheet looking at a comp set and like just picking a penetration rate and then just like, you know, dragging the cells out five years and hoping for the best. Uh, there's much more that can be done there. On the supply chain and logistics side, so basically today, like it costs, like the FF&E package we put in our units costs us less than 4,000, like the assets are like $4,000. Per, um, for a one bedroom, for example, which is a fraction of what uh, hotels pay. Uh, we have basically, we buy directly from manufacturers overseas and we've built our own distribution centers that have you know, in, own homegrown uh, technology for inventory management and where we ship goods to our cities every day. So basically like the price that we pay to the factories, the, the, the landed costs in our, in our units is really minimal. Um, and then uh, there's a series of uh, you know, uh, tools for um, uh, revenue management. So I know pricing is like an, an, an area where technology is often claimed as a big driver of performance, but I think um, you know, having a really strong team of like machine learning engineers and, and aggregating data sets for, from the hotel industry and from short-term rentals, and then we use our own historicals, like just blending all pieces of information and creating you know, feature generation, restaurant density, uh, you know, a distance to, you know, trip top for trip advisor rated locations. Like we've just built dozens of these kinds of features that represent the quality of a location. Uh, it's, um, and that, that serves on the underwriting side, but on the pricing side, there's, there's a lot of sophistication that could be applied to, uh, you know, generating stronger rev pars out of the, uh, you know, data analysis. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then anything that touches the quality of the guest experience, like basically making the app the hub mm -hmm. of the experience for the guest, I think is, is, is something that's, um, that's coming that hopefully we'll, we'll be leading. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when it comes to product, your product team per se, are they focusing on any particular area of product to develop? So if you're like the, the product and engineering, like everything I just described yeah. are, are tracks. Oh, I, I failed to mention maybe another one on, um, on the operations side. So basically today, the model in a hotel, if I want, uh, if uh, my shower pressure is weak or I don't have hot water, I pick up the phone, someone really, like answers the phone, and then maybe they'll type something into the system. Maybe they'll you know, speak to someone else that will then go and bring me something to the room. Whereas now what we're doing is like making the, 
like through the app, the request goes straight to the agent that is like the person that's responsible for resolving that task. And that provides us also great visibility when it comes to SLAs and meeting brand <coughs> standards. Um, so just basically the automation of like the work, like the jobs platform and what we call our dispatch platform, I think that's also um, uh, a, a huge opportunity. Okay, good. A couple of questions here from the audience. One is that uh, you've removed costs from your daily operations. How are you removing the distribution costs? Um, so, yeah, that's um, right now. You know, we've 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 partnered with well, we have, we distribute with, across a lot of uh, we work with a lot of OTAs. Uh, our blended cost of distribution, if you look at percentage of like total revenue versus all marketing and distribution expenses last year, was sub 10% of revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's with about a third of our revenue coming through direct, and there's no marketing expense against this. So just a really high customer satisfaction score, and now like a growing inventory of properties across more and more markets means that we're getting a, a large share of, of repeats and referrals. That's driving about a third of the revenue. Um, we also work with Airbnb, uh, which provides a, like which has really attractive commission rates. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think the thesis there over time is, you know, on the one hand, I would love for to keep working with OTAs and not even think about the demand generation side of the business so long as they can be, you know, take into consideration like how commissions should scale with our, with our size. And so long as the commissions stay reasonable, then, then you know, there's no urgency in, in, in driving those down to improve the P&L. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's, a, it's a rise of direct, um, and uh, which is happening organically. You know, we expect about 50% of our revenue to come in direct by the end of 2021. Right, okay. Uh, Shruti was on a, on a panel earlier today and she mentioned that there's some elements of um, uh, how much of your business is corporate and she mentioned that you think that the GDS is, uh, the corporate is growing and do you, uh, sorry that just jumped through there. So she mentioned that is corporate growing and do you accept the limited service experience? Um, so how much of your business is corporate per se? Yeah, so today, like business travel is a, is a minority of our revenue. And that's actually a big initiative for this year is for us to improve that. I think there's certain things like from an experience perspective, I see a couple of uh, questions here on the security side of the, of, of the business. So depending on um, you know, the size of the asset, like we actually in some buildings have, have some security staff, um, but um, uh, there's just like a few things that the business traveler is looking for that we're not providing today. As an example, like a, a loyalty program, like there needs to be a personal benefit from a business stay, and today we're not offering that. Um, and um, and then you know just having 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 more locations in cities. Uh, so like in New York, even though we're in New York, we have three three buildings in New York. Uh, we there's a lot of neighborhoods where we, we have nothing. We have nothing in Brooklyn and. Um, or even in Los Angeles, we, have, we don't have a live property yet today. So it's difficult to lock in these like big contracts and to have like a really loyal business guest unless we have like really complete coverage. And we're getting there, but we're not quite, quite there yet. But, mm -hmm. but we're gonna start building some of that, some of those, some of those capabilities. There's no reason why a business customer um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be interested in a, in a really nice place at, at, at a more attractive price point if we can also deliver more personal value through the loyalty program. Sure. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about sustainability. Uh, Shepherd Eco announced their launch with Starwood's sustainable hotel brand. Treehouse just opened up in London recently. What is Sonda doing uh, to make your property sustainable and cater to that? Yeah. Um, so, um, I think you know one big program that a lot of hotels have, have pushed forward is attempting to get guests to opt out of housekeeping and like the linen change and then like using a ton of towels and like the laundering is a really big consumer. So as as I explained earlier, this is not something that's part of our like very few of our guests actually ask for frequent housekeeping, um, and you know, we're not going to you know change linens mid stay and so on. Uh, so I think that's one piece. Uh, you know, we're not honestly we're not particularly innovative yet on that on that perspective. Um, we're really focused on like building more efficient stay. Uh, but at scale, like there's a lot of things that we can look into, especially as we have more control over the the development and and standards that we want our developers to uphold. Um, we're going to be able to, to 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 put more pressure to ensure that those standards have met. But but today there's no kind of coherent program that exists. We just hired a head of sustainability, mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that's going to translate into a roadmap in the next several months, which is going to translate into action, which is going to translate into results. But we're just there's nothing we can boast about just yet. Okay, um, we touched a little bit on on the business mix, but just to come back to that point, um, in terms of your your channel performance versus direct, uh, you said that you're getting predominantly more direct at this stage. Um, is that the direction you really want to go, or do you want to also mix that up, or do you want to stay with more direct? You know, to me, um, what I care about is an awesome, an incredible experience, and I care about free cash flow per share in the long run. Those are like the drivers of value for the business and for the guests. So, um, 
you know, where the demand comes from is kind of uh, a secondary to this. Um, so if, there's, if, if generating more direct demand essentially costs us more than what we have to pay to our distribution partners, it's irrational for us to do it and we're not going to do it. Um, so there's two pieces to that equation. It's the cost of distribution and how efficient we are driving direct. And the bigger we are, the more efficient we're going to be at driving direct. And so that's going to have to be responded you know, by our distribution partners with more reasonable commissions as we, as we reach more scale. If, if we weren't unable to get those more reasonable commissions, uh, then uh, it's going to make more sense for us to you know, invest more aggressively in direct marketing programs okay. that, that are going to help, you know, help the free cash flow of the business. Okay. So just coming back to another question here, apart from your uh, lodging part of the business, what other services are you looking into, if any? Um, so right now, you know, there's, there's the apartments business and the hotels, which are really like the, the hospitality, um, and then there's residences, and that's it. You know, we're, we've been expanding internationally quite aggressively um, in the last year. We have a lot of international markets that are in flight, a few of them that have been open for a while, like London and Rome and Dublin. And we, we're present also in Canada. We just opened Toronto. and We've been in Montreal since the start, and we're, Vancouver is about to open as well. Um, but um, yeah, no, we're really, we're really focusing. That's, that, that's, that's, that's really it for now. We realize like, through the corporate housing experiment that you know, we can't just have a side gig and be great at it. So that, that's what we're, we're sticking to right now. OK, good. Um, going to just come around to what we call the lightning round now, and we're going to mention a couple of words, and I want you to give me what immediately comes to your mind. So, so let's start with sustainability. Hmm. Yeah. Um, a, a brand requirement in the long run. Okay. Netflix? Um, extremely high design and performance standards and great culture. Mm -hmm. And interest rates? Uh, probably a new normal. Mm -hmm. uh, social media? Uh, addictive <laughs> and voice of time. Yeah. Um, Co-working spaces? Um, unattractive economics at scale. Okay, working remotely? Hmm, I'm curious to see what's gonna happen there. Um, probably undervalues the importance of building relationship to drive meaning and work. Mm -hmm. Vacation? Uh, hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I, I just came back from Japan, spent 13 days there. By day like 10, I was like, okay, I want to go back to work. So in, moder in all the good things in moderation. Okay. And finally, retirement. Uh, why retire? It's a long way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I was watching Warren Buffett's documentary, and like how old is he still, like, you know, showing up to the office and looking at the annual reports, and I find that quite, if, you're, if you yeah. love what you do, yeah. then you can do it for a long time. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, in terms of hotels versus the alternative formats, uh, you guys recently announced the move into a more traditional hospitality format, uh, such as hotels with lobbies, typical guest suites, etc. Could you talk a little bit more about that business evolution and what Sonda will bring to what would be considered more the legacy hotel format? Yeah, so basically um, the opportunity for us there initially is to look at independently operated hotels, ones that oftentimes brands didn't want because they're too small. They're oftentimes in interesting neighborhoods, oftentimes like interesting you know, historical architecture, um, but they have been given no love. Um, so the interiors look outdated. Um, they're poorly operated oftentimes, and I mean both like on the RevPAR side, like poorly distributed mer merchandise, poorly priced. And then um, the guest experience is oftentimes not that great. So we'll just look at listings on Expedia, on booking, and then identify ones that um, are in interesting areas that don't have great scores and, and where we know that if we come in and then improve the design standards, um, you know, and this is like a core capability that we've built is just like to, especially cosmetically, rapidly turn something into, into that, that isn't attractive into something that's, that's beautiful and functional. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if we afterwards improve the quality of guest experience and do so in a more labor efficient way, then there's tons of value creation. And so the economics of our hotel business are even stronger than our apartments business. Mm -hmm. And when we originally started the business, we didn't think that we'd go into the hotel business as we are right now. We thought we were building the kind of anti-hotel chain. But it turns out that by having to build basically an, an operation that works for distributed inventory, we were forced to consider a really labor efficient model. Um, and, and then after that, we realized that once we transposed that over to hotels, guests loved it, and the cost structure was just radically lower. Um, and so there's both you know, for assets that we identify uh, that aren't managed by brands. Brands do a really good job on the RevPAR side, and so it's difficult for us to meet kind of their Monday through Thursday RevPARs. But if you, like for now, although we're, those are capabilities we want to build, um, 
but, uh, but for hotels that are independent and that are quite small, uh, you know, increasing the rough part, reducing the cost, improving the guest experience is something that can be done at scale. And so that's, that's something that uh, we're expanding to really aggressively. And if you think in particular about the opportunity in Europe, that's the vast majority of the supply. If you look at a market like Paris, it's over 70% of the keys that are, of the 80,000 keys that are kind of in central Paris that are subscale independent hotels. Mm. And so those are massive market opportunities. And so that, that's a model we're going to be rolling out quite aggressively. Okay. You mentioned earlier as well um, the, the major chains and loyalty programs. Um, obviously, we had Jan Freitag here from STR the other, the other day talking about his predictions, and uh, he put up a good slide that showed all of the varying uh, brands that fall under the chains today. Um, they seem to be focusing very heavily on loyalty programs to encourage uh, loyalty with their, their guests. What, how, how does Sonda view this? What, how do you believe that a company like Sonda will be able to continue to grow loyalty with your customers outside of what you're already doing? Yeah, so uh, the, the, it, the business traveler, the road warrior, you know, the value of those points pays for their vacation right. every year, and it's difficult for them, you know, it's, it's basically, you could view it as, um, and I don't love it from a societal perspective, but really what it is, is, um, you know, uh, Business travelers getting some value f that would, uh, you know, some of the some of the costs that the their company has paid for their business travel, a slice of that is returned back to them personally in a way that isn't taxed. Like that's basically what it is. It's like they're taking money from the government and their employer to finance their personal vacations. Like I don't love it. I wish the, I wish it was done differently. Um, but that's the standard that's set today. Mm. And so we're gonna have to think through really creative like good w ways in which we feel good about delivering value back to those uh, business travelers. So I think. That's one thing that's critical to uh, loyalty. Another thing is, frankly, just scale. It's difficult to build mm. loyalty without having a really great selections of, of properties. And even like for Los Angeles, of the three properties that we have uh, that, are, that are about to be launched, the three of them are, are in downtown uh, Los Angeles. So um, just like having a great coverage of markets and a great coverage of neighborhoods within those markets and of property types, so sometimes apartments, sometimes hotels, and then having non-urban destinations is going to be critical for loyalty. Basically, we need to look at how we can get the greatest possible share of people's travel. And, and if, if someone goes on Sonar.com and then they say, oh, I'm going to Tahoe next weekend, and we're not there, we're basically training them that starting your search experience when you travel on Sonar.com, it can, it can be a waste of time. You're better off going somewhere else. And if you really love Sonar, maybe you're going to book Sonar there until we really have uh, a lar large scale and, and geographical coverage. Mm. Do you believe it's important for your, your customers to have loyalty programs? And, or is, are, are your customers primarily the demographic where they feel that loyalty programs really don't matter to them anyway? The younger traveler seem to don't have that tie toward the loyalty program. So are you attracting that type of traveler more or how, how do you see that? Um, one thing that's for sure is that a loyalty program doesn't make it worse and it probably, my intuition is that it probably improves the odds of loyalty a little bit. Um, obviously, yeah, the biggest drivers are like, do you have a great experience? Do you have great coverage? Mm. Um, and you know, do you have a great marketing engine to like, you know, keep keep the engagement th with those with those uh, customers going? But uh, no, I, I think I think a loyalty program is like something that that's that's necessary to do even for our guests. Although that's just intuition, we haven't done it yet, but we're going to dedicate some effort right. into, into testing that out. Okay, so it's to come then. Yes. Okay, so there's a question here: How will you meet multilingual challenges when going international with your communication tools? Will you be using existing tools, or will you build your own? Yeah, we so far we've been using our our own tools. Um, there's some parts of our stack that needs to be adapted to internationalization. We have a team of engineers that's working on that right now. Uh, and then, you know, our, our, our staff that basically communicates with our guests is already multilingual and we have a center, a contact center in Europe and we have two in North America. So uh, that's not, that's not a, that's definitely one of the easiest, most predict, like easiest things to pull off is, is multilingual. There's lots more about building the tech stack that's more uncertain and challenging to pull mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. And speaking of international markets, how have you found your um, reach going out to there? What challenges have you faced going international? Obviously, it's quite different to working within the North American market. What have perhaps been some of the main challenges moving internationally with a company or a business such as yourself? So every, every market, every country requires its own strategies. We hire local people, local general managers. The first three months, they basically create basically a launch plan and strategy. And we don't, we don't okay growth before we have this really clear picture of 
regulatory environments, uh, you know, identify properties, prospective economics, kind of guest experience and operation decisions that have to be made. Um, so we hire folks that produce this. Once we're convinced that it makes sense, they go and execute. But I'd say like there's a lot of changes from country to country on the real estate market and the mm. regulatory environment. On real estate, for example, like multifamily, large scale development in a lot of parts of the world is just not, is, just doesn't happen. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, for, and, and on the regulatory side, most European markets for us are markets where it's primarily uh, going to consist in our hotel business. So we're gonna overweight our hotel business in, in Europe. If you think about places like Amsterdam or Barcelona, like really, those are places that aren't, that we're getting a new hotel license is challenging in the core areas of those cities. Mm. And so the only path to operate a hospitality business in some of these markets is to basically convert properties, assets that already have the hotel licensing, uh, which is a capability that we've now built. So, um, so depending, yeah, the regulatory environment really constrains what the growth strategy looks like and there's a lot of variance there. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, that obviously must impact then your growth opportunity as well, or the time or the speed to market as well. Yeah. yeah, indeed. At the same time, it's also a great barrier to entry if there's a finite quantity of license that exists out there. If we're a few years ahead of competition to aggregate some of these assets and brand them, mm. uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, those, those are locked in. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, in terms of you um, opening offices, you, you're primarily based here, but you have other offices outside of the North American market in London. Um, what about mainland Europe or continent Europe? Will, will you be looking at Germany or France or Spain or anywhere like that? Or are you just going to base your operations out of the London? Yeah, there's still, there's still some debates about what our continental European office will be. But, but uh, you know, Europe is still like, you know, sub 15% of our business. So, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll make a choice on the location probably this year. Okay. How, how receptive has the European market been generally to, to the model? Uh, excellent. Yeah. yeah. It's very promising. Yeah. yeah. Especially on the hotel business hotel conversion business there is quite strong. Yeah, good. Um, would you consider providing the technical solutions that you're building to other hospi hospitality players uh, as a SaaS model? There are debates about this at our executive team. Um, we're, just, we're just not ready. Like we're, you know, it's, it's difficult enough just to build the tech internally. Um, then to after that open it up to other users and, and so on is going to be challenging right now. But uh, it's something that we, we haven't excluded that option from occurring in the future. Although. The mission of the business is really not to be a, you know, a software provider, but rather like an oper a brand operator. Um, we think there's a lot of value there. Um, would we bonify it with something like this and open up like our distribution revenue management capabilities potentially, but um, not in the immediate future? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well then I think, unless there's any more other questions from the audience, we are pretty much out of time. Okay. Francis, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you.